honoured to be joined by none other than Australian Olympic athlete Brooke Stratton. Welcome. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks for being here. So I think where we're going to start, I'm going to actually explain what the Connect and Reflect workshop is and what I usually do. Um, and then we're going to jump in and answer some questions for you. So the first thing that we usually do is we come together as an athlete community and we like to share our common goals, common interests, maybe some challenging things that we're going through. Um, and I think it's really important to open up that conversation and be able to chat about the things that are working well and maybe not so well. And I guess being able to share that in an inclusive environment um, not only helps us to reflect, but also to progress as an athlete and also a person. So I've been following your journey for quite some time now, and I know you've got some um, awesome stories to share. So on behalf of the Academy, we are so appreciative that you've taken the time today to answer some questions. No problems at all. It's great to be here. I'm going to start off by, I'm just going to get you to introduce yourself and also, I guess, talk about some of your major achievements that you've had up until this point in time. Yep. So my name is Brooke. I am 27 years of age and I am a long jumper. Uh, I started athletics when I was five years of age. Um, so I've been doing this sport for a very long time now and I've been fortunate enough to have been selected and to have represented Australia on many uh, international teams, uh, one being the Olympic Games in Rio in 2016, um, which was extremely exciting. It was a, a goal of mine from a very young age and to have been able to uh, achieve that goal and, and represent my country on the biggest stage possible, it was an amazing experience. Um, also represented Australia at the Commonwealth Games in 2018 on the Gold Coast. So that was another incredible experience being able to represent my country at a home games. Um, and to have made that experience even better, I was fortunate enough to have won a silver medal. So that's definitely up there with uh, my career highlights. And uh, I'm also the Australian record holder in the women's long jump. So my personal best is seven metres and five centimetres, which I jumped back in 2016 in Perth. That is an extraordinary list of achievements. I mean, looking back, you know, you've been doing athletics since you're about under eight, I think. And being an athlete myself, you know, we've competed together and I've seen your journey and I've been following it um, up until this day. And I know that those many achievements would mean so, so much to you. Um, and another thing I think about is athletes your age, you know, it's very rare to have such longevity in the sport. And often younger athletes will want to try different sports and experiment a little bit when they're young. So have you ever done any other sports? And would you ever think about trying another sport other than athletics? I started little athletics when I was five years of age. Um, and as well as doing little athletics, I was also um playing basketball as well so me and my sister um, both played in a basketball team together she's about a year and a half younger than me um and that was really cool being part of a, a team environment and i really enjoyed um just having yeah having different sports to be able to play um and as well as my athletics as well. Um, but I grew up in such a competitive, sporty, sporty family that, um, yeah, like I would literally play every sport under the sun with my siblings out in our backyard. So, um, yeah, like if, if I had the opportunity to play another sport, I would definitely put my hand up to, to yeah, to give it a go. But I think being where I'm at at the moment with my long jump, um, being at the level I'm at, I got to be very mindful, um, you know, of the the risk associated with, you know, being involved in other sports and the injuries that could come from it as well. So, um, I definitely did play numerous sports when I was younger, but when I started, you know, reaching that level where I was you know, quite competitive on both a national and international level. I had to make the call whether to, you know, completely focus on my athletics or to keep, you know, playing other sports. And I chose to focus on my athletics. 
And I think that's one of the most difficult things is often sometimes when we're younger, we might be choosing to try different sports because our friends are doing different sports or it could be that peer pressure and, you know, having opportunities be placed in front of you and ultimately you have to make those, those hard decisions. You know, am I going to go out and um, have fun with my friends or am I going to go to bed early and be prepared and ready for the competition the next day or in, or in the weeks and months ahead. And I just want you to touch a little bit on that and how peer pressure has maybe impacted you. Um, more so through my teenage years, I definitely felt that there was, you know, a lot of peer pressure to go out partying every weekend and drink alcohol. And um, yeah, some of my friends are like smoking and doing that sort of thing. And I think, you know, having such a clear focus on where I wanted to go with my sport, I was really able to block all that out and block all those distractions out. Um, so, yeah, basically through year, year 12, even year 11, um, I didn't really socialise a great deal with my friends and I would have absolutely loved to have, but I think that's just part of, you know, making sacrifices and I had the goal of, you know, hopefully getting to the London Olympics, which unfortunately I didn't get there, but I always, you know, set goals to keep me really focused and motivated. And I think a lot of people, you know, during their te teenage years do uh, struggle to be able to say no to all these things and be able to, you know, keep that clear focus on their goals and what they want to achieve. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, so many young athletes end up quitting sport earlier than what they probably should because they get caught up in all these like you know distractions on the side which is fine because you know everyone's different and everyone has different goals but yeah for me I think I just had to really just stay focused and you know if I had the goal of getting to the Olympics I knew that that wasn't going to happen if I was out drinking every weekend um or if I was, you know, partying until 3 a.m. every weekend because, yeah, I, I had training to get done and I had, I had goals that I wanted to achieve. Can you talk just a little bit about the turning point for you? I mean, just on a little bit of a side note, your dad is your coach and I, you know, I'm not sure has been your coach for your whole athletes career. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit, but I'd love to know the turning point for you and some of the decisions you've made and the goals you've set and how that sort of unfolded and when you decided you really wanted to take this seriously. Um, pretty much my whole athletics career. I started off with a couple of um, coaches just down at the local little athletics centre. Um, so they probably coached me maybe for a year or so before my dad decided um, he wanted to take me on as my coach. So pre pretty much say most of my career. So I, I guess like from a very young age, I had the goal of getting to the Olympic Games, like as young as grade one. So that's when I watched Kathy Freeman uh, represent Australia and win the gold medal um, at the Olympic Games in Sydney. So from grade one, that's when I told myself like I wanted to be Kathy Freeman one day. I wanted to win a gold medal for Australia. And like obviously being in grade one, like you know it was all about having fun um and I'd just go along to little little athletics every Saturday and just yeah just wanted to you know improve and just strive for PVs um I didn't know how much potential I had but as I was getting older I realized yeah I had some potential I had some talent I was breaking state records Australian records and yeah, and just kept progressing every year really nicely. Um, and then I think things started to get a little bit more serious uh, before I qualified for the World Youth Championships in 2009. So um, yeah, so I qualified for these championships and that's basically when I realized that I needed to, yeah, start making sacrifices. I needed to start, you know, really knuckling down. I quit basketball because I realized that, um, yeah, if I wanted to continue on this pathway, I needed to train specifically for long jump. Um, however, I did continue on with a few other events that I would basically just use as my fun events, like triple jump and hurdles. Um, but yeah, after I turned 
18, I think, or 17, that's when I, I realized that my clear focus has to be on long jump because I was starting to progress to a level where the Olympics were well within my sights. And I knew that if I wanted to, to get to the Olympics, I had to, yeah, just start making better choices, do those little one percenters when it comes to recovery and nutrition and all those little things. So definitely was well worth it. Um, but yeah, I think having that clear focus has definitely been the reason that's allowed me to, yeah, continue to, to reach my goals. Absolutely. And I think following on your journey, I know that, you know, we don't always have a, um, an easy pathway to our goals and what we want to achieve. And you touched a little bit about your eating habits and recovery. Um, I know that you've been through a few injuries through your time and if you could chat about that and I guess what you've learned from that and how that's defined you or um, assisted you as an athlete. Yeah. So I guess like the challenges and the tough times started for me, it would have been towards the end of 2011. So basically I traveled over to Germany in July and I, I equaled the under 20 Australian record and jumped a distance of six meter 60 which was a huge shock to me because it was it was a distance that I didn't realize that I was capable of jumping um, and this distance was only five centimeters off the B qualifying standard for the London Olympics in 2012 so basically I had a year to improve five centimeters um, and I definitely knew that was possible based on how well I was progressing in the years prior um, However, this is when things started getting, uh, I guess, quite challenging for me. Um, I started getting like extreme fatigue. Um, I was like having like, you know, stomach issues. I had vitamin and mineral deficiencies. I just felt absolutely, absolutely exhausted every day. And I was back and forth at the doctors trying to put a finger on why I was feeling this way. Um, all through 2012, my performances were, were declining um, and I saw no improvement at all. Like I could barely get out of bed. It was just like such a struggle. Um, so all through 2012, I just, yeah, I just wasn't myself and my energy levels were just like really average. Um, and the, yeah, the hardest thing for me that year was, one, I missed out on the Olympics because I didn't qualify. And two, I was back and forth at the doctors trying to figure out what was going on and because I knew that I wasn't feeling right. And every doctor I saw was telling me that I was fine, nothing's wrong. Um, but I knew something was wrong. So that's when I decided to see uh, a gastroenterologist who sent me off to get uh, a gastroscopy. So they put a camera down into my stomach and they diagnosed me with celiac disease. Um, so that was, that was the real turning point for me, I guess, um, towards, you know, yeah, getting my health back on track. And I was able to, yeah, to get back to being my healthy self after um, having to completely change up my diet, which was really hard and challenging. Um, but yeah, I, I got back on track. And in 2014, I qualified for the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow and won the national championships. And a week before I was due to leave for Glasgow, I went and saw a physio because I'd had back pain probably for, I reckon, going on two months. And because I had the Commonwealth Games ahead of me, I decided that I was just going to ignore this pain and I was just going to keep training through it until it got to the point where it was so bad that, like, I could barely walk. Um, and I went to, yeah, to see a physio. I got sent off for an MRI scan and I was just expecting to check in with my doctor who was going to let me know the results and he was just going to say yeah you've just got a little bit of joint inflammation or something like that but I was told that I had a stress fracture in my L4 vertebrae and I, I remember just absolutely like yeah bursting into tears when I was in this appointment because 
like it was my first senior international team that I'd made and I'd struggled for, you know, a year and a half, uh, you know, prior to my celiac disease diagnosis, I was just starting to feel healthy and back to my normal self. And then I get told that I can't go to the Commonwealth Games because I've got a stress fracture in my back. So that was um, probably one of the hardest times of my career so far. Um, having had something so amazing ahead of me and then having had that taken away from me so close to the date that I was supposed to leave. Um, so that was tough and it meant that I couldn't, couldn't train properly for almost three months. Like I literally did, did barely anything besides a few rehab exercises for three whole months. So it was, yeah, it was a really big, big shock to me you know having been able to train every day healthy um and then all of a sudden getting this quite serious injury that yeah didn't allow me to keep doing what i would do every day so that was pretty tough and then it kind of was a bit of a bit of a spiral from there um got over this back injury had a pretty good run for a couple of years went to the 2015 world championships uh, competed at the 2016 Olympic Games and then after Rio uh, I had a stress reaction in my cuboid bone on the outside of my foot and then in 2017 I had a stress fracture in the sesamoid bone um, which is in your big toe and then in 2000 and I actually had a couple of years injury free, which was, which was great. Um, and then in 2000 and or 2019, so last year, I started struggling with my thyroid. So um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is a, another autoimmune disease, um, as well as my celiac uh, and yeah, that's been something else that has, has made this life of an athlete be very challenging too. Um, so I have to take medication every day to keep my thyroid levels, uh, at an appropriate level. Um, and yeah, so I think obviously things could be a lot worse. And I always say that to myself, um, you know, people are out there in far worse off situations than the situation I'm in. But I'm just trying to make do, you know, with what I've got and what, you know, what I can make do with. And, yeah, I think just make sure I make the, the most of every opportunity that comes my way. Yeah, it really does sound like you've been through quite a lot in such a short period of time. Uh, I guess myself as a wellbeing coordinator and as an athlete who's been through some injuries as well. Um, it, it can be a really challenging time. And I guess, can you just touch on a little bit about your mindset during those difficult times and what helped you to overcome those adversities and I guess, continually be motivated to work towards your greater goal? It's a great question. Um, so I think the more injuries and the more setbacks I've had over the years, I've learned to be able to deal with them a lot better. Um, I remember in 2014 with my stress fracture in my back, um, I just thought it was the end of the world. And I just, I really struggled to, <laughs> to stay positive. And I think it was because it was my first serious injury. And it was the first time I've actually you know, not being able to do what I love every day. So that was really tough. Um, and my next injury after that was the uh, stress reaction in my cuboid, which was one that took a, a long time to get better. And I, I did see a sports psychologist during that injury because of how much I struggled through the stress fracture in my back. And one piece of advice that my sports psych told me during that time was to focus on the things that you can do rather than the things that you can't do. And that's always stuck in the back of my mind because, you know, you're always, you know, 
inclined to to think negatively of these situations um and it's hard to see the positives you know when you can't do what you love every day but i think if you can try and look at these situations in a positive light and try and take away any positives you can from it uh it's going to put you in good stead when you are back uh, competing and just yeah just being able to focus on things that you normally wouldn't be able to focus on um, so just putting more time into uh, recovery or you know if you're not able to you know train normally but you can swim or you can ride just try and enjoy that like it's it's a nice change sometimes and it breaks things up for you and um, yeah it's as I said like it's hard to be positive all the time and I know that you know you have your days. Some days you, you feel positive and you feel happy, but then other days you, you really struggle through it. Um, but that's just part of sport and it's part of life. You're going to have the ups and the downs, and I think it it just goes to show that you can't t can't take anything for granted. You've just got to enjoy every moment of your sport um, because you just never know when it, it can be taken away from you. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess talking about in light of Difficult times, obviously, in Victoria, we've been faced with this pandemic and COVID-19 and having restrictions and being in lockdown. How has that impacted you as an athlete and I guess your training plan? Um, and what have you been doing to, I guess, get yourself through this difficult time? Yeah, it's been super tough. Um, I think you know, just being really positive about the situation and trying to look at the positives rather than the negatives. Um, because obviously, you know, a lot of negatives come from not being able to travel, not being able to train properly. Um, but I guess for me, I have still been able to train, whether it's in my garage doing a gym session or at the local oval because I can't access the track. Uh, I'm still able to get everything done that I need. And that's what um, I guess has kept me going. But it has been super tough. Like obviously this year, I had plans to travel, to compete overseas, to be at the Olympic Games. Um, and none of that ended up happening. And uh, yeah, and I think it, it's great knowing that hopefully it's going to go ahead next year, the Olympic Games. And it definitely has allowed me to stay focused because I've still got that same goal in the back of my mind. Um, and I think that's the important thing when it comes to, you know, being in situations like this, you know, you've got to set yourself goals to keep you focused and you've got to, you know, get into good routines. So you stay on track. Um, but I definitely have had my days. Um, I try and be a pretty positive person, but you know, when you're, when you have like these huge goals and, and big plans ahead and it all gets taken away from you, it's pretty hard to deal with. But I've been very fortunate to have a great support network around me. Um, and I think that's definitely helped me be able to get through this year. And I'm just, yeah, really looking forward to next year and hopefully we'll have some competitions scheduled maybe towards the end of this year or early next year, providing things improve so yeah you know fingers crossed yourself and all the other athletes out there can resume back to some type of normality and be able to compete and play and do what they love um, very soon uh, in terms of my next question now I just wanted to touch a little bit on the relationship that you have with your dad as your coach and also if you can talk me through um, the support team that you have around you. So do you see a sports psychologist or do you have a dietitian or a massage therapist? And I guess how often you might see them and how they've really assisted you in your journey as an athlete. Obviously, as I said earlier, my dad's been coaching me from a pretty young age and it, it's worked really well for both of us. And I think that's part of the reason why I've been in the sport for so long because he's been able to make training enjoyable for me if anyone knows him like he's such a character and you know he's always making not only myself but everyone around him laugh and I think if yeah I feel like if I was 
I may have had another coach. I'm not sure if I would have continued on this pathway uh, for as long, but yeah, it's been fantastic. And um, I think the biggest, the biggest strength of having him as my coach is that he knows me so well as a person and I feel like I can really open up to him as well, him being my dad. So uh, that, that was fantastic. And I think since I've moved out of home as well, um, so me and my fiance Nathan bought a house last year and um, I think that's really strengthened my relationship with my dad as well because um, we have... I guess he's able to put on the father hat and the coach hat now. So we're able to sort of, you know, switch off from training, which was something that I felt was a little bit of a struggle when I was living at home with him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely been a lot better now. Um, but it's, it's been fantastic. Like I wouldn't, wouldn't want to spend, you know, my career traveling around the world with anyone else. It's been, it's been so fantastic having him by my side through this this whole journey. Um, it would it'd be so awesome. Yeah. Um, but in terms of my support team, um, I see a physio at the VIS every week. Um, obviously, haven't really been able to see him that often or regularly lately, but he's been calling me weekly just for check-ins, which has been fantastic. Um, I have a strength and conditioning coach who looks after all my strength and conditioning, um, which has been great. And he's regularly keeping in contact with my dad, Russell, um, just to make sure that everything's on track and um, they're on top of, you know, what my training, uh, my weekly structure looks like to make sure that I'm not doing too much um, and everything's sort of blending in nicely with each other. Uh, I've got a sports psych who I see at the VIS. Um, I'll generally see him, or sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's, you know, once every few weeks. So it's great to be able to check in with him and just have a chat, um, just talk about, you know, everything and anything. And he's helped me a lot, uh, especially through injuries over the, you know, the last few years. Um, so I just want to touch on that super, super quick because we have a sports psychologist within our academy and all of our athletes have the opportunity to access um, our sports psych, Natalie, at any time. Um, and I just want to ask, what would your advice be to those student athletes who are contemplating maybe seeing a sports psychologist, but they're a little bit unsure about what it might involve or thinking about, oh, is this something that I would need? Definitely. Um, I was the same, like, you know, going back maybe five or so years ago, I was always shying away from seeing a sports psychologist because I didn't think I needed to see one because I didn't, I didn't think that I would benefit from it um, or I didn't need it. But as soon as I saw a sports psychologist, it really changed my perception on a lot of things. And um, it's been, it's been amazing. So I definitely would recommend, um, you know, reaching out and, and speaking to one because, um, the way I see it is, you know, if, if you need any sort of advice, whether it's, you know, in relation to your life or your sport or your study, um, and if you are struggling a little bit, you know, you, you've got to reach out to someone. You've got to make that effort to try and help yourself um, because, you know, half the time with my sports psychologist, we just, you know, we just talk about everyday things. And I think just having him to talk to um, really goes a long way. And there's obviously many benefits as well uh, in relation to sport and, you know, some of the techniques that, you know, you can use when it comes to dealing with anxiety and nerves um, around, you know, sporting environments and around competitions. And yeah, for me being, you know, more of an introvert, learning about my personality type um, and also, yeah, just learning about how to stop overthinking too, because I'm a big overthinker. Um, so just, yeah, just coming up with little, you know, techniques that allow me to be my best self. So I definitely would recommend it. Uh, it's been fantastic. 
uh, for me to be able to see someone and talk to someone, um, especially, yeah, during, during the hard times as well. It's, it definitely goes a long way. One other thing that I really want to touch on is the pressure in a competition, especially being on the world stage, competing at the Commonwealth Games and also the Olympics. Um, what are some strategies that you have used to cope and deal with that pressure? Maybe the nerves, the anxiety, could be the crowd, could be the other competitors. Um, and what are some things that help you get through those really tough moments, whether that's routine or it could be um, trying to have a certain mindset? So I've definitely been one to have very high expectations of myself. Um, but I think, you know, just having that confidence in yourself and your ability is something that, yeah, is definitely going to be vital, especially when competing at a high level. Um, I remember saying to my fiance, Nathan, um, just before my Australian record jump of seven metres and five centimetres that I was going to jump big that night because I had so much confidence in myself and I just trusted the process. I trusted that I'd put in the work and I think having that confidence, you know, is enough to really be able to get the most out of your body and yeah i think you just got to be really um just mentally ready and um confidence can go such a long way and i think that's something that i've learned over the years um you know just yeah just being i guess confident in yourself and and the work that you've done and just knowing that you can go out there and achieve what you set out to achieve. Um, and the only person that can make that happen is yourself. But it definitely, it definitely gets very nerve wracking competing at a major championships. Like I remember walking out into the stadium in Rio and I was like crying. Like I had tears running down my face because I was so overwhelmed and I was so nervous and I was so happy at the same time. Um, but I just, I knew that I couldn't put such high expectations and I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself because I know that that's not healthy in sport and going into the Olympics, you know, people were, you know, talking about medals because I jumped seven meters that year and I just, yeah, I just had to try and block all that out and just focus on what I was there to do and, I think the more that you do compete at a high level, uh, the more comfortable you feel out there. And I think for me, yeah, just trying not to put that pressure on myself and just trust that I've done the work is something that I try to take in with me to every competition. Awesome. So I've got one of my favourite quotes here and I'd love for you to respond. So comparison is the thief of happiness. And I guess I just want you to talk about what it's like to be a female athlete, social media and Instagram and, um, you know, being in a call room with other athletes, being out there on the competition arena around other athletes and how do you manage? That's a great question. Um, so every athlete is obviously different and you know, some athletes are very intimidating, especially, you know, on a world level. And, you know, when we compete in Australia, I feel like, you know, there's so many friendly people that you're competing against and like everyone's like really good friends. Um, however, on an international level, you know, you've got women that, well, when I have competed on an international level, I'm competing against women that I've, been watching on TV since I was a young girl. Um, I shouldn't say a young girl because not that much older than me, but yeah, over the last few years before I really had that breakthrough, um, I was watching them in Diamond League meets and now I'm there competing with them. So I think you've just got to, yeah, you can't compare yourself with other athletes because we're all different. We all have different, you know, body shapes and sizes and I think, yeah, you've just got to really just be able to block everyone else out and just stay really focused on yourself because at the end of the day, like, you know, you're responsible of your own performance and comparing yourself to others is only going to, you know, take away from that. 
So yeah, just being confident in your own body, your own skin and yeah, I think that's just being happy and just enjoying your sport. So my next question is about your life outside of athletics. And I know that in talking to a lot of athletes, they usually will have their um, blinkers on and they have a really strong focus in their goals and in their sport. But often, you know, you can't be an elite athlete for your whole entire life. So do you have any goals outside of athletics that you're working towards? And what was it like for you to finish school? And I guess, how did you make the decision to go on to uni after that? So after I finished VCE, I knew that I wanted to go to university, but I didn't really have much of an idea what I wanted to do. Um, but so I took a gap year uh, after I finished year 12. Um, and that gave me more of an idea what pathway I wanted to go down and what I was passionate about. So I started a Bachelor of Health Sciences in 2013. And I only finished it last year, actually. So it took me, I think, seven years. Um, but that was because I was doing it part time and I was deferring some semesters. So it definitely um, took a lot longer than what it could have. But it was it was amazing having that balance between um, sport and study. So I think it was the perfect outlet for me to be able to have something else to focus on around training. Um, and I think it's super important to have something to fall back on, um, you know, post athletics career. And that's something that I've really been thinking about a lot lately because, you know, I'm turning, well, I just turned 27, but I'm turning 28 next year. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think that I'll still be doing athletics until maybe my, my low 30s. But it's something that, yeah, I, I want to make sure that once I do retire from sport, that there is something lined up um, because, yeah, I don't, I don't want to finish long jump and not know what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, so having that bachelor degree is something that I can fall back on if need be. Um, I'm also doing a Cert 3 in fitness at the moment, which um, me and my partner Nathan have um, yeah, more of a long-term goal of starting up a gym one day. Um, so yeah, just, just trying to make do of, of, you know, these opportunities while I can and while I've got the time, but it's definitely important, um, not putting all of your eggs into one basket and just having other things to focus on, on the side, whether it's a part-time job or study, um, or a hobby as well. So another question, I guess, in alignment with what we've just been talking about is organisation and being able to not only have that work-life balance, but also to cope with it successfully. I mean, we've, we've both been athletes and I'm sure the athletes watching will um, nod or agree that it's really difficult to be able to get enough sleep, to be able to eat all of the right foods and attend recovery training sessions and track and gym and um, all of these things that you need to do on top of the schoolwork, it, it can be quite challenging. So what advice would you give? And I guess, how did you cope um, during year 12 and during uni? Yeah, well, it's, it's honestly all about time management and being able to be productive with your time as well. Um, so when I was in school, um, I definitely prioritised my sport over my studies. Um, and I think it was because, you know, in year 12, um, I had the goal of getting to the Olympics the following year. So it was, you know, it was kind of, do I focus on my year 12 studies or do I strive to try and achieve, you know, my ultimate goal of getting to the Olympics? So I kind of put my study on the back foot there. Um, I did obviously like, you know, try in year 12 and made do of you know, best of what I could uh, around travel and training. Uh, but it definitely came down to, you know, just being able to get into a really good routine around school and training and making the most of the time that you've got as well. Um, because, you know, you can be so unproductive with your time sometimes. And, you know, if you're, yeah, if you're scrolling through Instagram for hours or you're on Facebook or you're watching Netflix, like there's so many things that you could have been doing during this time to make you, you know, a lot less stressed and 
yeah, get the work done that you needed. So I think just prioritizing what you need to get done. And for me, like I found just setting a schedule. So um, blocking in time to put into uni work around training and around um, anything else that was happening in my life. Last question, I promise, and then I'll let you go. Um, I just want to know what your goals are moving forward and also what advice you would give to younger student athletes who are really committed to achieving their goals and I guess who are feeling a little bit down and out because of the whole um, COVID-19 situation. So my major goals are to hopefully win an Olympic medal one day. Um, That would be a dream come true. Uh, I've made an Olympic final but I'd like to go that little bit better and hopefully bring home a medal, whether it's in Tokyo next year or in four years time or yeah, four years time. (laughs) It's a little bit confusing. Um, And probably the advice that I would give to younger athletes uh, would be not only to enjoy it. I think it's super important to, to enjoy your sport and do it because you love it. um, But to just, trust the process and you know work as hard as you can to make your dream become a reality because that's what I did um you know I had the goal of getting to the Olympics since I was in grade one and you know I worked my butt off over all these years and I was able to make that dream become a reality so if you yeah if you put your mind to something you can definitely achieve it I'm so honoured to have a chat with you and I know that I've learnt a lot and I know that athletes will be able to feel that connection with you in some capacity and be able to walk away from this and be able to reflect on their own journey and their experiences and um, moving forward, what goals they want to achieve and how they're going to get there. So thank you once again and we wish you all the very best for Tokyo next year and fingers crossed for that gold medal that you're hoping for. We appreciate it.